Uh, sure. And before we get going. You got it. Yeah. Um, okay, so my name is Andy Sabatier. I am also a doctor of physical therapy. Uh, I am completely obsessed with your breathing. And I know that sounds a little bit funky, and I'm going to make more sense of that throughout this. So I'm going to talk about me. I'm going to qualify myself. I'm going to talk a lot about your breathing. And normally I start with talking, but I'm actually going to start with movement. What we're going to do is we're going to kind of take a quick little hit of understanding your breathing and feeling it. Then I'm going to tell you about it. And then we're going to dive really deep on like actually how to make this thing work for you instead of against you, okay? So I want everybody to imagine you're holding a tennis ball, okay? So go ahead and grab your tennis ball. Notice how my fingers are kind of curved, right? I'm not holding it like this. I'm curving those fingers inward. I'm going to take that tennis ball and I'm going to put it right where I got the wind knocked out of me when I was a kid. Right below my sternum, which is up here, down to this little squishy middle spot. Put your hand there, okay. So with this tennis ball, what I want you to do is I want you to take a few little tiny doggy sniffs, okay? Dogs sniff like this. Little ones, where you feel like this is moving in your chest isn't going, <laughs> right? We want to kind of keep it down here. So try to sniff right into that tennis ball. See if you can make it move. Yeah, you got it. Okay, cool. So now we're going to stop being dogs. We're going to go back to being humans. We're going to take a smooth, slow human inhale that goes from this tennis ball and flows from here up your chest like this. Bottom to top. Nice. Now, if you just let your hands go like this, let them be nice and soft along these lowest ribs. These ribs, eight, nine, and 10 right down here. So I got my fingers against my body. I got my palms against my body. I'm going to take that same slow, smooth human inhale and feel it expand into my fingers and my palms and then up into my chest. Nice. Now, that simple little thing that you just did can change your life. I should just leave because like, that's it. That's going to sound like oversimplified. But truly, how a, human excuse me, how a human being breathes impacts every single thing in their life. We just do it so often and so automatically, we don't even think about it. So that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to talk about it a little bit. OK, where's my little clicker? Oh, yeah. I got to at least talk about this quote. So there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. The time has really come to talk about this thing, to talk about your breathing. Because we are literally dying for a new way to help ourselves. So let's see if this will work. Yes, so we just tried this. Thank you for everybody trying and humoring me. What I want to do is I want to tell you a story, OK? I'm going to tell you a story about me. I'm going to tell you a story about you. And I'm going to tell you a story about this idea of breathing performance and what that means. So Academy West, that's my organization. We are going to spend some time talking, feeling, seeing, and using your breathing perhaps a little bit differently than you ever have in your life, because that's how you understand something. Now, my background. OK, that's me on the left. That's also me in the center. So I went to Auburn. I played lacrosse at Auburn. I was a college athlete. And I went to NYU, went to PT school. But that was after I had this weird career as a professional skier. I don't even really know how that happened. I kind of backed into it. And when I was at NYU, I learned a lot. I went off to Stanford and learned about ICU, critical care, physical therapy. Because for like eight years, that was my job. I was the primary PT for the St. Charles ICU. I absolutely loved my job. It's a really weird job. Let me meet you on the worst day of your life. Hi, I'm Andy. Nice to meet you. I'm better than nothing. Let's get out of bed. That's basically the job. I got to get you stronger without killing you. Weird job. Now, along that way, I got really obsessed with this, talking about breathing. Now, when I say talking about breathing, I'm really specific about those words, OK? Because it turns out that talking about breathing is what's keeping us, I don't know, dysfunctional. Because the way we talk about breathing is full of confusion, misunderstanding, and harm. I used to be part of this problem. That's why I feel so adamant about it. How do we talk about breathing? We say breath a lot. Do I have good breath or bad breath? That's the smell in my mouth, so that's really confusing. Or we'll say like, oh, I'm out of breath, or I'm short of breath, or I'm losing my breath, or I'm catching my breath. None of that's actually true. You're never doing any of those things. You're either breathing or you're not breathing. Case in point, like nobody in the ICU is like, oh my god, that guy's dying. Quick, get him some breath. Right? Nobody does that. So we're shifting away from breath. We get the breath, right? The breath. That's a little bit more mystical and a little more confusing. 
this thing. It makes it sound like it's separate from me, like I could actually lose it. Or we say breath and work. Now, you already know how I feel about breath. I really don't like work. I mean, I love my work, but how do we say work? Oh my God, I gotta do the work. I gotta go to work. I don't wanna go to work. Look, breathing's not your job. It's a privilege. It's playful. It's performance. It's anything but work. I've seen what it looks like to work to breathe. It's not pretty. So then we get this, just breathe. We're shifting from a noun to a verb. This is good. But just breathe, it kind of leaves something to be desired, right? It's kind of like saying, just walk. This whole place is built on the idea that that's a little more complicated, right? Or just relax, just calm down. We can do better than that. So breathing. I love that word. I'm going to use it all the time because breathing involves movement. It's an action. It's a verb. It's constantly happening. So we're going to differentiate functional breathing from dysfunctional breathing. Now, functional breathing helps every single system in your body. 20,000 times a day, this thing is boosting you through everything. It's what we're going to work on tonight. It's 10 words. In the nose, diaphragm first, Chest, second, shoulder stay still. It's actually kind of a dance move. In the nose, diaphragm first, chest second, shoulder stay still. But if we're being real, like what does that dance move look like? It looks like this. Diaphragm first, slow progression up the chest, shoulder stay still. Now that's sped up like two and a half times speed. So you can see lots of repetitions because breathing is really subtle. And the more slowly and effectively we're doing it, the better off it goes. So it doesn't matter what you're doing. This is kind of how the system works most efficiently. Now, dysfunctional breathing, scary part, harms and hinders every single system in your body 20,000 times a day. It's not just that breathing effectively helps, which it does, but breathing dysfunctionally actually makes everything worse. All the things, think of the worst thing in your life, think of the biggest problem, the most nuisance thing, it's made worse by dysfunctional breathing. Now, this is what it looks like. Subtle shift, but notice how we're not moving so much in the abdomen, but instead the chest is moving first and most. It's moving a little bit more vertically. It's actually kind of leaking into the neck and shoulders. Now, this is the most common breathing pattern that I've evaluated in. Medical professionals, teachers, athletes, all people that are really good at trying, right? Now the problem is the harder we try, the worse it gets because we actually start recruiting the shoulders more. This happening up here is catastrophic for your breathing and your health. Dysfunctional breathing is linked with some pretty impressive things. I'm gonna leave that up there for a second and just take it in. If anything surprises you as related to your breathing, shout it out. Boom. Every time, it's such a weird one. Crooked teeth down here, right? Crooked teeth, a lot of people say that one. Facial development. Diarrhea. Diarrhea, definitely. We're gonna talk about all the weird stuff. Osteoporosis. Yeah, super surprising. Here's the one I'm gonna highlight the most, okay? Undefeated stress. Every single person experiences this. So bottom line, how we breathe matters. This isn't just breathe. How? That's what I'm all about, the how. So how do we breathe? Well, we use this. This is the human breathing system. That's a term I made up because I don't know how else to describe this thing. We live in this like systems-based medical world, right? You have your cardiologist and your pulmonologist and your neurologist and your dermatologist, each in a different system. This is the system that impacts every other system. It stretches from your nose to the base of your skull to the tips of your shoulders. It wraps around your thorax. It wraps around your abdomen. It goes all the way to the bottom of your groin. That's how we breathe. But if you Google breathing, what image is gonna come up? Lungs. Lungs, very good, right? Lungs are like the recipient of breathing. They move according to how this system moves. So really when we're talking about breathing, we're talking about the brain. Biologically speaking, every single human being breathes how they feel, and they feel how they breathe. So we wanna understand this. Specifically, we're gonna talk about the brain stem right here. This is this tiny little part of your brain. It's the oldest part of your brain. And it's where we've got a couple of important structures. So this pink structure, that's called your amygdala. That's gonna be like your center for processing intense emotions like fear and memory with that fear. 
Then we've got this little thing right there, that blue spot. It's called locus ceruleus. It literally means blue place. Because if you slice a fresh brain in half, there's a blue spot. Because it produces a blue chemical called adrenaline. Now, right in between them, where that little teal hexagon is, that represents your pre-Botzinger complex. Think of it like your breathing pacemaker. It's going to take information from all over your nervous system, from your gut, from your chest, from your vessels, from your muscles, and it's going to calculate how fast or slow you're going to breathe. So you don't have to. How cool is that? All day long. But when we're talking about the muscles that accomplish breathing, that means up here, the accessory muscles, the chest wall, and the abdomen. Those muscles are controlled right here, consciously. So you own your breathing, but your breathing owns you. Little example of that. We're all gonna do a quick exercise. Everybody's gonna take a deep breath in, and then you're gonna blow it all the way out and hold it out. And I can guarantee you nobody's gonna die. Ready, big breath in, blow it all the way out. Hold it out, calm yourself. Feel that carbon dioxide starting to build up. It's gonna get a little stressful here in a second. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life, there's nothing more stressful than drowning, but that's what's happening right now. Your body can take five minutes without breathing, without brain damage, but you're gonna feel it in way less. Nice, good. I'm looking to see what you do when you breathe back in. Breathe how we feel. All right, if you're still holding your breath, you can go ahead and breathe back in, you're fine. Well done. So all that to show, yeah, you own your breathing and your breathing owns you. Now, we've got three different groups, accessories, chest wall, and abdomen, three groups of muscles. We're gonna understand these muscles because they're really different. They all work together, but they work differently. They're kind of like this amazing vehicle that you drive through your life. It actually controls every single body system. The abdomen is the engine that's powering and pumping every single system. The chest wall is kind of like the chassis and the frame of the vehicle. And the emergency response system is up here in the neck and shoulders. The problem is, this car's being driven by a five-year-old. That's how we all are. But this five-year-old's a little bit weird. This five-year-old's actually got a lot of personalities. There's this five-year-old in the neck and shoulders. They're wild. Then there's this five-year-old who's in your chest wall. They just love to raise their hand. And then way in the back of this classroom, here's the most shy kid. That's your abdomen. They're also the smartest kid, okay? So your conscious breathing trains your subconscious breathing. How you breathe on purpose influences the rest of your breathing. So you could breathe, I don't know, 15, 20 breaths on purpose a day, and it's going to influence the other 20,000 that you're going to take. So inhaling is what we're going to talk about first. This is a teeny little part of your life. If my life is like between my hands, this much is spent inhaling. The rest is spent exhaling. Isn't that weird? Like this whole time I'm talking to you, exhale, 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 and then a quick little breath in and then I keep exhaling. But the inhale is where all the impact is felt. Kind of like this rocket ship has to burn all its fuel in the first 30 seconds that it flies, and then it coasts. Inhaling is those 10 words. In the nose, diaphragm first, chest second, shoulders stay still. So let's go through those 10 words. So your nose is amazing. Your nose is about the size of your fist in your head. It's huge and it's there to optimize all the air that you breathe. It performs more than 30 functions in your body. I'm just gonna go through a couple of them. It's gonna filter all the air you breathe. It's also going to humidify, warm, and pressurize all the air that you breathe. When you breathe in your nose, you stay hydrated. When you breathe out without opening your mouth, you stay more hydrated. Makes a big difference. But it also produces this chemical. This is nitric oxide. It's produced by your mucus cells. So when you breathe in your nose, you breathe nitric oxide down into your lungs. It serves three important functions. Number one, it's your first line of immune defense. It neutralizes viruses and bacteria and fungus, including coronavirus. Number two, it is an oxygenation booster. So adding nitric oxide in makes it easier for hemoglobin to distribute that oxygen to your cells. And number three, and most importantly, it's a powerful vasodilator. So nitric oxide, opens our blood vessels, which lowers our blood pressure, lowers our heart rate, boosts our circulation to our tissues and from our tissues. So we get better performance and less soreness. Pretty cool. Now, notice this tissue right here, okay? Inside the nose, this is spongy, warm, vascular tissue. It's actually erectile tissue. It's the same stuff that's in your genitals. So your nose goes through this cycle every three hours. 
One side of your nose swells with blood and the other side shrinks. And then every three hours, it switches back and forth, day and night, through your whole life because your right nostril is connected to your left brain and your left nostril is connected to your right brain. So that shift in blood flow gives one side of the brain a break and one side of the brain a heavier load. There's a decreased regularity in those cycles in people with insomnia, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia. Breathe how we feel. So your diaphragm and nose are connected. Remember that little doggy sniff thing we were doing? That's because we can use our nose to get our diaphragm to work. You were feeling your diaphragm move. We're gonna come back to that and spend a little more time doing it later on. So let's talk about your diaphragm. This is what I've been waiting to do all day. This is the weirdest word. It's got a PH and a GM. It's spelled in an awkward way. Does anybody remember that, uh, that prophylactic device, the diaphragm, that was on the market for a while and then they recalled it? We're kind of doing everything we can do to make this an awkward word. And you'll actually hear people avoid saying it. Belly breathing, breathe with your stomach, all this other stuff. First of all, your belly is down here. Your diaphragm's up here. It's kind of hard to understand where this is. It's a part of my abdomen, but it's in my rib cage. This is the single most important muscle in your body, so we want to understand it. So it's attached to my xiphoid process here in the front, ribs eight, nine, and 10 on the sides, and all the way to my lumbar spine in the back. Every time I inhale, this dome-like sheet of muscle pulls downward. And then when I exhale, it moves back up. So tattoo this image on your mind. We want to be able to feel, see, and use this muscle. It's everything. So it's got a couple cool connections. Here's the connection between your diaphragm and your heart. In fact, it's a more important muscle than your heart because it controls your heart. So we've got this connective tissue that surrounds our heart. It's called the pericardium. That's actually a part of your diaphragm. So every time you inhale and exhale and your lungs change size, so does your heart, which regulates your nervous system. Here's, this is like a view looking from the bottom, looking upward through the body of your diaphragm. Notice how it spans your entire rib cage to your spine. It divides your top half from your bottom half. So, your esophagus goes right through there. One of the main jobs of your diaphragm is to control stomach contents and keep it in place. So dysfunctional breathing might look like acid reflux. It also might look like stomach cramping or indigestion or diarrhea because my diaphragm doing this thousands of times a day actually massages and percusses my bowels. One of the weird calls I used to get in the hospital would be when somebody's waiting to discharge but they haven't had a poop yet because you can't leave after surgery until you've pooped. So they'd call me up there and be like, can you just talk to this guy about his breathing? And halfway through, he'd go from <sighs> to, he's like, I had a five day poop. Can somebody help clean this up, please? And so poop whisper is like low on my resume, but it does exist, right? But this is the most important structure, I think, for this room. Notice, you can't really see it well here, but notice right here, these long stringy strands that come down with the blue pin. Can everybody see that? Those are called crura. C-R-U-R-A, it means legs. So the legs of your diaphragm come down and attach to your lumbar spine, L1, L2, L3. So there's dozens of studies going back decades that link dysfunctional breathing and diaphragm weakness with low back pain, with posture problems, with balance problems. It's even linked to chronic ankle sprains. Isn't that crazy? People with chronic ankle sprains have thinner diaphragms that move less. And as we train the diaphragm and it gets thicker and moves more, weird, they stop spraining their ankles. Their falls start to decrease. So it's like this major piston pumping and powering everything in your body. And it's like the shy kid in the back of the class, okay? Because it's made of different muscle fibers. You got 600 muscles that attach to your skeleton. Shannon could probably name all of them, right? But all those muscles are primarily made of fast twitch muscle fibers built for speed and power. That's why I can do all these things. Your diaphragm has more slow twitch muscle fibers than any other muscle in your body. So it wants to do this amazing multi-directional expansion thing thousands of times a day to keep you alive. It just doesn't want to move that fast. And it saves a lot of energy. So the faster we breathe, the more we leave it behind. And when we know how to, how to expand it and actually get it to move, we can train it to become faster. And those slow twitch fibers become fast twitch fibers. Okay. So this is your exhale muscle. I'm gonna breeze through a couple of these. This is basically the innermost layer of your abdomen. It's called your transverse abdominis. It wraps around your body like a corset and attaches to your lumbar spine. So every time you exhale, this gently squeezes inward. You don't even have to try. 
These two are like partners. Imagine I just took my chest wall and went and opened it up like that. This is the view from inside out. Notice we've got this arcing line of the diaphragm here with its vertical fibers. You can barely see them. And then we've got these horizontal fibers right here from the TA. Right here, you can almost see it that they braid together. Anybody see that? It's a little hidden. I think that's so cool. I think that's so cool because it shows that this is a force couplet. These things are opposing each other. So that's what it's doing to my spine when I'm functionally breathing. That looks like balance to me. That looks like low back pain going away. So the pelvic floor is like the bottom of this big ball of muscle in our abdomen. Three different layers of muscles that sit in my pelvic bones and they're gonna control pee and poop and babies, basically, right? Now, this thing moves like a piston. Every time I inhale, my diaphragm pulls downward. My pelvic floor moves with it, which can sometimes be opposite of what we think. We think like inhale and tighten, uh-uh. Inhale and it moves down. And as I exhale, it moves back up. So it moves as I breathe, but it also moves as I move which explains why when I stand up sometimes, I might fart, right? Uh-huh, I know, everybody in here's done it. You'd be cool about it, right? So it's kind of like the struts of my car, right? Your struts can't be super loose or super tight. Otherwise, you're gonna feel every bump in the road. Your pelvic floor certainly can't be super tight all day, and we don't want it to be super loose all day or we'll be pooping our pants. It has to move as you move. So this is one giant moving ball of muscle. This engine is constantly pumping. And when it does this, it's providing stability and flexibility to my spine, just like the cables on the bridge. They're built to withstand the forces of nature. So dysfunctional breathing is kind of like snipping some cables and adding cars to the bridge. So make no mistake about it, this is our core strength. I know, really weird, you got a PT talking about core strength. So fun fact, my wife is a PT, she's one of the best PTs I know. And we had a two year fight about core strength. The most PT fight you can have because all I'd ever heard as an athlete and as a therapist was set your core, hold your core, tighten your core, brace your core, draw your belly button towards your spine. Anybody ever heard this before? Uh-huh, I've said this before. Now with this understanding, that's well-meaning, right? That's targeting this area. It's just doing it in a dysfunctional way because if I do that, I can't breathe functionally. Tighten this all up, where am I gonna go, right? If I put it another way, let's say I want to get strong arms. And so I go to the gym and I pick up some weights, right? Do some curls. But the person next to me is just holding weights really tightly. Who's going to get stronger? Definitely this person, right? This person might come out with little T-Rex arms, but they get a lot stronger, a lot faster moving through the whole range of motion. So breathing is the range of motion for our core strength. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So let's move on to chest second. Chest gets all the credit for breathing, right? That's where my lungs are and my heart. But chest comes second, not our primary group. The chest, this is kind of like the chassis and the frame of the vehicle. It's there to defend the driver and transfer energy to the road so that we can drive. That's what our rib cage does. Strong and flexible, it defends my heart and lungs and transfers that energy like levers to my spine so I can move. It does this through these intercostal muscles. These are located between and behind every pair of ribs you have. Some are involved in inhale, some are involved in exhale. All of these are fast twitch muscle fibers. They are built for speed and power. So they're kind of like this kid. Every time the teacher asks a question, they're like, call me. Teacher calls them, they're like, I don't know. I forget. Love to raise their hand, but they're actually not really contributing. They're actually kind of taking away resources from the classroom. So, the abdomen and the chest wall work like hands pumping a pair of bellows. They're very different, but they work together. The bottom hand pulls downward. The top hand kind of pulls out and upward. That creates an inhale. That uses energy. When the hands come together, that's an exhale. That's basically passive. But it's not that simple because we know that this hand is slower, more efficient, more effective. The diaphragm with its slow twitch muscle fibers. Two thirds of your quiet breathing happens without the chest wall moving at all. Only when we need a bigger, more powerful breath do we then recruit the top hand. So bottom hand first, top hand second. That's functional breathing, people. It doesn't really matter if I'm running a meeting or running a marathon, having a baby, having a panic attack, waking up, going to sleep, living a full life, dying a peaceful death. This is how the system works. So 
It also makes sense for why it's so easy to dysfunctionally breathe. Because this kid loves to raise their hand every time. It's faster. So our chest pumps faster and faster and faster. And a really simple example of real life consequences of dysfunctional breathing is a cramp. My chest is pumping away and my diaphragm is like, ah, I can't do anymore. And we get pain at ribs eight, nine, and 10. We have to stop doing what we're doing. There's a million things people will tell you to do, but nobody's telling you why that happened. And the harder we try, the worse it gets because let's face it, when you can't breathe, you can't function, which means we're going to this. We're recruiting the shoulders. Shoulders, stay still. This kid is nuts. If this were a classroom, this kid would be in the front row for a reason. He's got to keep our eye on him, right? Because this kid's either falling asleep or like waking up and looking around like, can I go to the nurse? Can I go to the bathroom? That kid is trouble. Now, we're talking about everything in the chest, right here, your pecs, everything on the back, like your scapular muscles, but mainly the neck and shoulders. These are a part of my survival. We're gonna hone in on these two muscles. This is my upper trapezius muscle, my shoulder shrugger. And then right here, my sternocleidomastoid. That's my blind spot checker head turner. Put these together, I can raise my shoulders and turn my head, that's cool. That helps me survive because it stabilizes my eyes, that's good. It also helps me to socially engage. Imagine if I were talking to you right now and I don't move my neck and shoulders at all. You don't wanna to listen to me. You don't wanna trust me. So they're a part of my relationship to other people. But the most important thing that my survival muscles do here is that if something scares me, <laughs> shoulders come up and head turns. That's your oldest reflex. There's no getting out of it. We all get something scared like that. Now, these muscles are wasteful because they use a ton of energy and don't provide anything in return. Each of my arms weighs about 5% of my body weight. So no matter what I'm doing, if I move my arms like this, I'm lifting 10% of my body weight. But I'm expanding my chest less than 1%. This doesn't do anything to my chest. So it's dumping energy in, not getting anything back. So if energy is valuable, we're wasting it here. And these are painful. Because of the repeated nature of breathing, even just a little bit of movement in these muscles means that I get headaches, neck pain, shoulder pain. I kind of pull my posture forward. But instead of expanding my chest gradually outward, I pull it up and down so I get thoracic pain, mid-back pain. And if I'm moving all this up and down when I breathe, I'm either holding my abdomen really tightly like my PT told me to do, or I'm letting it be super loose. Either way, we've got back pain, hip pain, pelvic floor pain, incontinence, prolapse, all because of this. Now what's so scary, these are the fastest muscles in your breathing system by far because they're the only ones with no connection to your spinal cord. These two muscles, only two muscles below the face that just go right to your brainstem. So there's this nerve, cranial nerve 11. It goes from my brainstem to just these two muscles. So every time I'm stressed or anxious or afraid or in pain, my shoulders move. That makes sense, we've all been there. But what we don't realize is this is a two-way street. Repeated movement of these muscles sends a tiny little signal of stress and fear and pain right to my brainstem, right to my little pre-Botzinger complex breathing pacemaker. So we breathe how we feel. That's actually why the mouth is such a big deal. Now we know the nose is amazing, it does all these different things, but if I just shut it off and abandon it, I'm replacing it with a big, open, dry hole. So we breathe faster. If we tried to go to that little doggy thing, and just went, ah, everything goes up. Not only that, but we get dirtier air, so more inflammation, drier air, more inflammation, and asthma reaction starts right in the airways. Not only that, but we shape our skeleton. This is where the crooked teeth come in. So thousands of times a day, our skeleton is shaped by our breathing. Dysfunctional breathing means the head grows forward. The jaw grows down, back, and narrow. Not only that, but those same things go all the way down the spine, the shoulders round, the back sways forward, everything goes through our breathing because we do it so much. We underserve all these organ systems. We already talked about the whole balance thing, bone density loss. This is where we get into the chemical element. Breathing is five things, physical, chemical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Chemically, it's all about oxygen and carbon dioxide. So if I breathe too fast, I just blow off too much carbon dioxide, and my body needs that, it needs both. So where does it get it? from my long bones. It pulls bicarbonate ions out of my long bones to balance that chemical reaction. So osteoporosis, osteopenia, loss of bone density linked to dysfunctional breathing. The same thing happens in our teeth. Number one cause of cavities, mouth breathing. Our kidneys don't pump, our guts don't pump. Remember, poop whisperer. 
right? Our heart doesn't change size. We only expand the top part of the lungs. We have receptors for our nervous system in our lungs. The top ones are for the fight and flight response. A single breath up here gets us more in that direction. Down here, rest and digest. So bottom line, this functional breathing perpetuates a cycle. Chronic stress, physical, chemical, mental, emotional, and spiritual stress, all increased by dysfunctional breathing, which means I get more inflammation. My body's response to a threat, doesn't matter what it is, that's what happens, which means I get worse immunity, worse healing, worse recovery, and I get weakness. We get weaker in the muscles that get overused and weakness in the muscles that get underutilized. That really leads to poor performance. Maybe that's my balance. Maybe that performance is my endurance or my strength. Maybe that's my digestion or my sleep or my sex life. All of these things are emotional experiences. Shame, guilt, and fear. We breathe how we feel. Shame that I'm not who I used to be or who I could be. Guilt that maybe I have something to do with it and I don't know how to fix it and fear that it's getting worse. It's not getting better. That pisses me off. All these strong emotions are absolutely linked with chronic pain, and chronic pain leads to more dysfunctional breathing. And honestly, if this was the cycle, my job would be kind of straightforward, but it's like that. Everything is twisted in on itself. One dysfunctional thing sets off a cascade of other dysfunctional things. And what do we say? Just breathe. And I'm part of this. For three months, when I first started casually getting obsessed with this, that's exactly how I would coach you to breathe. I'd tell you to take a deep breath in, just like that, right in front of your thoracic surgeon and your intensivist and your respiratory therapist and your nurse, and they're all like, you're the best PT, we love you. Meanwhile, I'm harming people. So when I went and learned about breathing mechanics and understood this, I came back with this idea of like, what do I do? How do I take just breathe and change this? Because what's the point of me being a PT? If I'm doing something for your neck or your shoulder or your balance or your pelvic floor and you're gonna breathe dysfunctionally 40,000 times before the next time I see you, what's the point? So I thought, what if I start with breathing first? That's the thing Academy West is built on. Breathing first, everything else second. Because no matter who you are, this is important. I just needed a patient. And I met this person, this is Patricia. This is in 2019, she was admitted to the hospital. She had to have a drain placed in her lungs. She has end-stage breast cancer. She's going home on hospice tomorrow. Now, that is not a PT diagnosis. That's like a leave me alone diagnosis. I want to be comfortable. She didn't look very comfortable. She's on five liters of oxygen and she's struggling to breathe. And I'm watching her going, I just learned this. What do I know? I'm just going to figure it out. And so I spent like 90 minutes getting her to talk about, feel, see, and use 10 words. And when I came back the next day, she said, what we did yesterday made me feel better than anything has in the last five years. I wanna do this for the rest of my life. And I started Academy West that day. And for like seven months, she was my only patient. Why did I need I had a full-time job here. This is just a little experiment. But every couple of weeks, I'd see her in her home and I'd watch her turn down the oxygen and her sats would stay high and she could move better. She'd get out of bed on her own. She'd climb the stairs. She'd go outside and watch her sunrise bike and the same tools that served her in movement served her at the end of her life. Because we breathe how we feel. And nobody wants to die <sighs> like that. So big sea change. And then all these people started coming out of the woodwork. One patient after another after another. All with different stuff. Maybe this person has chest wall trauma. This one has long COVID. This one's got Tourette's. This one's got incontinence. This one's got balance problems. This one's a runner. You name it, all of them, all breathing, all breathing dysfunctionally, all managed to get this positive cycle where we replace that one that's actually causing suffering with one that helps reduce stress, reduce inflammation using CO2, that really valuable chemical that makes us feel like we wanna die is also the thing that's gonna help us, right? Boosting immunity, healing, and recovery, getting stronger with every breath we take. Turns out core strengthening is about how you breathe, not about how many sit-ups you can do. But that means better performance. When you can do something the way you want to be able to do it or with less pain or less imbalance or just more confidence, that's an emotional experience. Love, joy, and purpose. You can't feel those things when a tiger is chasing you. But that's what happens with our breathing. 
So we're improving quality of life. So yeah, I admit it. Mastering your breathing, which is what I get people to do. I've done it with thousands of people now. It seems audacious, but really, it's a traffic light. I want to give you a life full of green lights. Those 10 words mean efficiency, safety, effectiveness, mobility. After green lights, come yellow lights. I love yellow lights. I'm not telling you to diaphragmatically breathe. We need the whole system to work in the proper sequence. The red lights, not safe. Stress, fear, pain, you're gonna cause an accident, you're gonna hit somebody. The outsized cost of dysfunctional breathing is so high we can't even wrap our minds around it because we can't even talk about it because we say just breathe. So talking about it, feeling it, seeing it, and using it is called nudging the system. We're gonna do that for the rest of this class. That is the process that takes dysfunctional breathing and shifts it to functional breathing. That's a huge step. But think of it as the first step towards your life where you're gonna use this. What's so cool about this? I may never see any of you again but you're gonna remember this and you're gonna use it literally forever. So before I keep going, we're gonna basically get into our inhale lab. I know there's gonna be questions and I'm gonna save the questions for the end. So right now I wanna go back to where we started, okay? Let's find that tennis ball. Find your tennis ball, go ahead and put it right here. Let's see some teeny little doggy sniffs right here. Don't let the chest move, just a little. Like that. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Nice, 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 nice. Okay, cool. So let's come to here. Smooth breaths, okay? We're gonna go inhale, try to hit my fingers first. This little tennis ball spot is everything. If you get this expands first, everything comes together. So if you're wondering where do I focus, it's right there. You can keep a hand there, put another one like this or put both hands like this. Smooth inhale that flows from the bottom to the top. If you've got it, close your eyes, tattoo it on your mind. Feel, see, use. Envision your anatomy in your mind. Nice. If you feel confident that you've got it, go ahead and stand up. It's gonna get harder as you get into gravity. Can I have one question? Yes, sir. Um, so if you have pa this is this is a, this is passive, you're not like I am gonna pass the ball and Yep, you're just trying to feel what's moving when you breathe. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if you can feel it. Stand up and put your hands here. If you need to put a hand on the chair in front of you, that's totally fine. But we want you to be able to feel this in a gravity-dependent position. Smooth inhale that goes to the front. Flows up to the top. If you feel like you've got it, put one hand up on your chest. Keep that other one in that feedback position. Slide your hands up to there. And now let them be flush against your body. We want your whole hand, your whole palm, everything against your body. Nice. You got it. If you've got that, just start shifting your weight side to side. We're going to add movement. It's getting a little hard. It's going to feel like rubbing your belly and patting your head. Now my job is to get you to feel this and see if we can nudge the system a little further. So if that feels good, just try to march in place. Cool. If you're feeling good and you can march in place, take a little walk around the clinic. Come back to this seat in a couple of minutes, but I'm gonna give you some space, I'm gonna give you some time. I'm just gonna kinda of check in. So, hands can be on your body, focus on your big functional breathing. All right, come on back, come on back. Everybody's doing beautifully. I see so many diaphragms moving. What's funny about this area <laughs> Is this not a place we're accustomed to looking, or talking about, or showing, or touching? Come on back to your chairs, you can have a seat. Come on back, come on back. Well done. Okay, special kudos because there's a lot of unique fall risks in here, so you're doing well. So that's all our inhale. We're gonna talk about all this stuff, but I wanna briefly make sure we talk about exhale. I don't wanna overload you, but it sort of seems unfair to talk about one without the other. So exhale, here's the Cliff's Notes. Slow it down. That's all it's about. If we are making the primary mistake with our exhale, that's speeding it up. <sighs> if we're taking a thing that's supposed to be slow and passive and speeding it up, we just made it fast and active. So we're gonna slow it down, but how do we slow it down? Well, first thing we can do is we can use our lips. 
That's the most accessible way to slow your breathing. <sighs> Works really well, builds a little positive pressure back into our lungs, very helpful. And I can't do it all day. <sighs> all look kind of insane, right? So we've gotta have other options. That's where we're gonna talk about this, okay? This is your glottis, your glottis. Everybody's gonna find their glottis. So take your hand, put it right here on your trachea, okay? This is also called your voice box or your vocal cords. We're gonna feel it. So this thing moves according to muscles, right? PT, we love muscles. So I'm gonna make some sound. I'm gonna change that sound. I'm gonna go up and down and feel this move. Uh, uh, uh. Give it a try, make some weird sound all the way up and all the way down. Feel it moving up and down, yeah. Feel that? Okay, so the whole apparatus moves up and down, but it also opens and closes, okay? This thing actually looks like this. This is your glottis. It's kind of beautiful. It's also super tiny. It's about the size of the white part of your thumbnail. Super small. This is your airway. So it's got these little ligaments in here. These two things are called vocal ligaments or vocal cords, but they're covered in these mucus folds. Vocal cords just sounds better than mucus folds, right? So these things vibrate. As it opens and closes, it'll change how the air is passing through. So think of the, you know, your pelvic floor is like the lower gatekeeper. This is the upper gatekeeper of all your pressure control. So it moves like this. Here's Bob's glottis. Bob's right over there. I almost pointed to Bob with the laser pointer. But this is Bob's glottis, okay? You'll see it just kind of moving and changing and moving around a little bit. It's really hard to see, but it's in there. It's like a little alien. So, this thing opens and closes. An open glottis, okay? Open glottis. My arms are going to represent the vocal, vocal folds, okay? Open glottis sounds like this. Inhale. No sound at all. Exhale. No sound at all. If I were to inhale with a partially closed glottis, it sounds like this. Could everybody hear that? Did that sound comfortable? Yeah. There are people that walk into my office all the time doing that, and they don't know why. And then we dig a little deeper and... They got a little confused when they came out of yoga class, or they've been doing it since they had surgery, or they do it just because they think they're supposed to, because it makes you feel like you're working really hard. This needs to be easy. That's like driving around with your e-brake on. You can totally drive with your e-brake on. You're just gonna wreck your car, right? Go have at it, it's your car. But if we want this thing to work for us, we gotta open that thing up when we inhale. So that's step one. Exhale, whole another story. If I exhale with a partially closed closet, it's gonna sound like this. Whisper my library voice. Okay? If my mouth is closed, here's what you hear. Just kind of sounds like I'm annoyed, right? I want everybody to try that. that In you yeah. Inhale with an open glottis, and you're gonna exhale with a partially closed glottis, and I'll tell you why. Try a few in a row. I'm just gonna listen. Everybody's got it. Now, why does that matter? What did you do? You just slowed yourself down. You slowed your exhale, just like you did when you pursed your lips, but you did it with your mouth shut, which means you're 42% more hydrated. Breathing out with your nose instead of your mouth saves 42% more water. Whoa, big deal. And you could hear it, right? Could everybody hear themselves? I had to really listen hard. You had to listen hard to hear me, but could you hear yourself? Yeah, right? And you could feel it. This is something you can hear, something you can feel, which means basically you're meditating. Now, I don't use that word because it's loaded, right? If I, like, let's just pretend you're some person who came in from, you know, burns and you had a heart attack or a stroke, and I come in and start talking about meditation in the ICU, you're going to be like, get out of here, buddy. But if I start about breathing, well, yeah, I'm breathing. You're breathing, I'm breathing. Let's talk about breathing. Because that's what it is. If you can hear it and you can feel it, you can lock yourself in on it. So we're going to use that. Now, there's a third exhale strategy. And I haven't talked about it yet. This is your whisper right here. This is, who wants to guess what that's going to make? What, what's that going to sound like? Bob, you're the only person with a hand raised. What's it going to sound like? Sound. Sound. Ah! I can make sound using this system, which is a big part of my life. The outward projection of your nervous system is your voice. So if I sound like this, how do you think my nervous system feels? Not very good, right? But if I can fill up the room with my voice, I'm confident, I'm effective, and I'm calm. 
So the easiest way to get this exhale strategy to work for you is to hum. Hmm. Nice. Now I'm going to shut up and let you guys do it and see how loud you can be. Ready? Big full breath in. Hum it out. Mm -hmm. You know what nobody does when they're being chased by a tiger? Hum. That's right. You are talking to your nervous system right now. Whether you realize it or not, you're breathing. Inhale, exhale is this nonverbal language that you talk to your nervous system all the time with. So now we're going to do a little baby exhale lab, okay? Now that you know how to inhale, how to exhale, all I want you to do is, as you're able, stand up from your chair and sit back down with your chosen exhale strategy. Maybe that's... Maybe it's, maybe it's, hmm, go for it. Have some fun. Play with your breathing. Inhale, exhale, slowly separate it from your breathing and try to stand up. You got it. Yeah, and try to keep it going as you stand and sit. It's like rubbing your belly and patting your head at the same time. Nice. Okay. So now I'm going to open it up a little bit. Okay. There are a million different ways to approach this thing, but what I would like to hear are thoughts or questions or anything that you've got. This is my favorite thing to talk about if you can't tell. So who's got a question? Yes. I have a zillion questions. Yes. Um, if there's neuro, sorry, impairment involved, um, uh, how, how can you work with that to improve breathing and exhaling as well? Because like voice quality, for example, yeah. can tell a big difference. Right. Um, an element of this is educational, but there's also a big part of this that's hands-on. Now, I have people come to these kind of talks frequently that I'll see them like a year later and they're like, yeah, I know you've never met me, but I really took what you taught me and like ran with it and now X, Y, and Z is better but some people have a really hard time. And it's often when there's more complexity, more pathology, more chronicity, like it's been a longer standing issue. So that's when a hands-on PT element really helps. Like if we're trying to retrain how to walk, we're gonna retrain how to breathe like that. And that, it's more nuanced, but what we tend to do is train the patient and train the family members to be able to do all the same stuff. Um, probably my most successful patient is a person with neurologic compromise. He's a five-year-old boy who I met when he was five, but he had his brain damaged when he was two, his head smashed in the ground a lot of times, and had a craniectomy, craniotomy, trach, peg. And I met him three years after the injury, and grandma's like, can you help me get rid of this tracheostomy? I was like, I, I don't know, I will try. But nine months, seeing him every two weeks, just gently facilitating and getting a little bit more training, he doesn't have a trach anymore. You know, and, and that's, that's a person who's totally dependent neurologically. Like can't follow a command. But what was so cool is along that road as we're increasing how much time he could cap that trach from like 10 minutes to 20 minutes to an hour to two hours to five hours to 24 hours to sleeping to sleep study to out, we watched him start to change, not just the way his body looked, because he looked like a long three-year-old when I met him, but he changed the shape, but he also started to, to like react differently. Like he started tracking, right? And he started laughing and like we'd hear his voice and we'd start to like see him. Sorry, that one really still gets me. Um, and that's also a part of this, right? My emotions are like right here. They're not buried because breathing's how you feel and like instead of coming home and crying my eyes out every night from the ICU, I'm like feeling all those emotions. But what he was able to do was to start seeing not like this, but like this. Because if there's a tiger chasing you, this is what you see. <sighs> but you can see the big picture and the tiny picture. So it's a little bit of a roundabout answer, but if we breathe how we feel and feel how we breathe, we just start getting this one thing to make a little bit of an improvement. It's a slow fix towards gradual improvement towards big improvement. So my answer would be slow and steady approach, training the caregiver, and also getting hands-on with a the therapist. Did that answer your question? Yes. Is that one of the zillion questions? Yes. Okay, say the next one I'm gonna ask Dana. What's your question? Mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to really work, I'm, I'm more of a nose breather than I'm, mm -hmm. and a mouth breather, mm -hmm. 
except when I'm exercising and I'm a big mouth breather. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to train myself to do inhalation, exhalation, um, but I feel like I'm panic stricken because all of a sudden I feel like I'm not getting enough air, mm -hmm. so I'm speeding it up. So mm -hmm. I'm inhaling fast and exhaling fast and doing that when I'm calling right? Totally. What should I be doing? Okay, so there's a lot of things you can do, right? One is just keep doing whatever you're doing and have at it. Okay. Um, my approach is breathing first, where if I have a cyclist, whether it's you know, amateur or professional, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna A, give them functional breathing. Make sure that they feel confident, they can feel, see, and use those 10 words, and that they've got solid exhale strategies. Then we're going to progress their cycling from a breathing first standpoint. Go out, ride your bike, go only as slow as your functional breathing will let you. Okay? Which means you're gonna to have to go slower than your legs will let you go. It means putting down the ego just a little bit, right? Because we know we can like go really fast and a lot of times we go out with exercise with the intention of like, I'm gonna go as hard as I can, I'm gonna get myself as tired as I can, I'm not done my workout until I'm like sore and <sighs> none of that has to happen. If you instead think, all right, breathing first, progress it. The line at which you have to <sighs> start dysfunctionally breathing starts to go up and up and up and up. And case in point is right here, okay? So I'm gonna brag about Ben. This is Ben, Ben, can you wave at everybody? This is Ben. Ben's the primary PT for the ICU right now. Ben is also the first clinical hire at Academy West. Ben was first my patient. And when we first started working together, he said, I have these symptoms. We looked at his breathing and it was dysfunctional. He's also a college runner, by the way, and like real badass. And so we gave him functional breathing and said, go run with this thing. And three weeks later, he's like, I'm running faster. I don't get it, but I'm gonna trust it. Flash forward you know, a year and a half later and he ran the Cocodona 250. He ran 250 miles straight, that's crazy. Ben just recently ran the Oregon 200. And that's a huge accomplishment on its own. He ran the whole thing like this. Right, just those 10 words and then a little whisper on the exhale, right? And he's like, Andy, when I was a few miles from the finish line, I didn't feel like I was suffering. I didn't feel like I was in the pain cave. It's like, I felt like I was dancing. Which, that's so cool, right? He won by two and a half hours doing that. So he was able to trust that steady, slow approach. If you can do that, it doesn't matter if you're trying to cycle or if you're trying to hike something or if you're trying to just literally train yourself to just never breathe with your mouth. Whatever it is, we take it from a breathing first standpoint because it kind of doesn't matter. It keeps it really simple for you. All you have to pay attention to is one thing. And because it's a movement, when you're paying attention to your breathing, you're paying attention to everything else. I'm so kooky at this point, I kind of have blurred the lines between like breathing and dancing and walking and running and exercising. It's all movement and it's all functional. And when you go breathing first, it's way more controlled because you're starting to see the big picture. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool, who else has questions? Okay, yes. Yeah. You know, how do I do that and keep, keep it going while I'm doing whatever, whatever the activity is? Great question. So what I've kind of devised is a system that we teach you the system, and the system sort of lives in your head. Picture red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple, colors of the rainbow. Each of those colors represents a different breathing strategy. They're all the same. I mean, they're all the same mechanics. In the nose, diaphragm first, chest second, shoulders stay still, controlling my exhale. But within that, we've got a lot of nuance. So pickleball, for example. The two colors you'd use in pickleball would be orange and purple. Orange is breathing as slowly as I need to. That could be anything, right? It's not as slowly as possible, just as slowly as I need to. Right, I'm waiting for that, that person to serve. trying to kind of get myself ready. And then purple, which is where we're gonna time your exhale to create power. You already know how to do this, right? If you turn on a tennis match on TV, what do you see? Yeah! Little exhale that they timed right when they needed power. So between purple and orange, you 
you've got breathing strategies that fit what you're doing. Now, if I take that same thing and I take it to home, right? Okay, I got a big package from Amazon on my front porch. Purple. I just supported my whole back. I've got everything working for me. And now I got to carry it all the way into the kitchen. Orange, purple to put it down. So there's a breathing strategy for everything. But all you got to do is just basically train yourself to think breathing first. It doesn't happen overnight. But it does happen pretty steadily and slowly. Because once that cycle starts to take hold of like, wow, I felt better picking up that box. Or I felt a little more like calm when they were serving the ball. Or whatever it is, you've got an experience that makes you go, oh yeah, okay, I'll trust my breathing again. And the more intense the functional activity that you're doing is, where you put your breathing first, the more it grooves it into your brain. So folding laundry, that'll help a little. Walking the dog will help more. Playing pickleball and thinking breathing first, that's hard to do. But in time, that definitely starts to add up. We have one patient who, she's 57, and she's the top level doubles tennis player in the state. She doesn't play singles tennis, but she loves doubles tennis. And she said the weirdest thing, she's like, I can't run a mile, Andy, and my heart rate gets out of control, and I feel super nervous every time I play tennis. So we gave her those two, orange and purple. Her heart rate went down 15 beats a minute on average playing pickleball and tennis. And she can run a mile. She had to run really slowly, but she could complete it. She just put her ego aside and was like, breathing first, just gonna trust it. Not gonna worry about how fast I run or how many steps I take or whatever. I'm just gonna trust my breathing. And she's like, Andy, honestly, it felt pretty relaxing. I couldn't believe it because I'm doing the thing that I didn't think I could do and I'm feeling better. So it's, it sounds oversimplified, but it's that simple of just every chance you get, feel your breathing. You feel those 10 words? Cool. Use it now. See it in your mind's eye. Feel it, see it, use it. That's the way we sort of steady chip away at this. If this were the first evaluation, okay, like let's just say you were my patient over at Academy West, which by the way, like I'm right over there. I'm like that big building that's by Bangers and Brews. So in our first event, first I'd get to know you, here are all the things going on in your life. I follow the biopsychosocial spiritual model of medicine. And then we would capture your breathing. We do that with a bunch of different measurements, the most important of which is a video where we have you standing by some mirrors and we capture your breathing from four different angles. And then we teach you this stuff. And I show you your breathing. And you're like, oh my God, that's what I'm doing 20,000 times a day? Or it's like, oh, I didn't know that that was happening. I've been really trying to do X, Y, and Z. But once you can see it, then we just start chipping away at it. And for that first interval of care, all you focus on are 10 words, feeling it. And in each episode of care, which we spread out every two to three to four weeks, we just give you a couple more tools. Just like we do with Patricia. Just give you a couple of tools, you play with those, you got 20,000 opportunities every day. Lots of opportunities. I mean, it's different from a typical PT setting, right? Three sets of 10. We've heard this a lot, four times a week. Different. This is every single minute of every single day, you have an opportunity to consciously pick it up or put it down. You don't always have to be consciously thinking about it. But anything is better than nothing. So it's kind of like my job in the ICU. Hi, I'm better than nothing. Nice to meet you, right? I'm better than just breathe. This structure is better than just breathe, and that's what we want you to trust. And over time, it changes lives. And it's more automatic than it is afterwards. Mm -hmm. And we have these like automated centers in our nervous system to make that happen. But if you think about it and concentrate and practice it, um, those proper mechanics or speed or whatever can, be, can become more automatic. Mm -hmm. So I have, it's a two-point part question. Have they done studies on neuroplasticity of uh, because to me, this sounds all like a motor control thing. Mm. Um, and I would, I would, I'm just curious like if there's MRI imaging or anything as someone mm. before and after. Um, and if not, you should make that happen. And, and then the, the second I part agree. is, how do you, be similar to, you know, if I, if I have someone walk in a certain pattern and we're working a certain way, you're not going to make that change in 30 or 45 minutes because you go home and take however 5,000 steps. Right. So the same thing happens with, with breathing. You know, what are some good cues or tricks that you give to carry that process over until it becomes more fun? Mm, two good questions. First one, I agree. I would love to do that. I don't know if there is any specific research to that effect. 
There is tons of research on breathing. It's mostly tied into yoga and tied into meditation. Not a lot of it's tied into functional movement. You know, the, 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 the tricky thing about, and this actually is kind of the answer to your second question. The most helpful thing somebody can do is shift how they talk about it. Because that's the first step to owning it. Yoga, meditation, mindfulness, breath work, energy. I'm not knocking any of these areas, but I am calling them all as not functional movement experts. Doctor of physical therapy, that means functional movement expert. We can own breathing in a way that's clear and relatable and research backed. So, yes. I thought I learned from your video that if you do 30 active functional breaths mm -hmm. Yeah, so as the, re the only way, you're exactly right. The only way that we're gonna get to the point that I can take a functional breath is if I can train somebody to talk about it. If they can talk about it or feel it, we're gonna get there. Some people, like we mentioned before, aren't gonna be able to regurgitate that talking. So I have to get them to feel that with my hands. For most people, I just gotta get them to be able to talk about it and then put their hands on their body so they'll execute those deep functional breaths. Um, but yeah, that's. Basically it, see it, feel it, use it. Every time you think of it every day, that's the way to make it stick. Oh, yes. There are a lot, a lot of CPAP breathing problems. Mm -hmm. Like I said, breathe forth, breathe, just jam your in the throat and all that. Mm -hmm. It seems like an auto clue cues or little vibrations like it works the diaphragm, you know what I'm saying? Initiating, initiating, initiating the breathing process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And a lot of my patients are coming from the pulmonology group at St. Charles or from Summit where they're coming either because they've been told they need to put on a CPAP or they don't want to wear their CPAP or their CPAP is making them bloated in their stomach or like whatever. It's So what we do is we strengthen all of the system around it so that when they are sleeping, they can begin turning those, not they, but the, the people that are allowed to sort of technically move this, the physician and the respiratory therapist, can start backing down those settings so that the CPAP isn't doing as much. And the people that really get it, that strengthen their system so much and work on everything from the tongue all the way to the pelvic floor, they get the ability to actually get off the CPAP. It happens. So I, I follow completely, uh, start talking like uh, you know, the upper thread and all that. Mm -hmm. That's it. One of the, so this is kind of an interesting thing. A lot of the patients that I get come from either mental health therapists or social workers, where it's somebody where they're like working on all these tools to manage the stress in their life, and they're getting all kinds of tools, but how do I physically put it together? This is that meeting of those two things. So stress management, like that's the one I pointed out like big time, stress is undefeated, and we have to be able to manage it. This is our way of kind of talking to our nervous system. You know, you can think of it like that nonverbal language you were talking about. Yes? I'm a solid sleeper. Okay. When I sleep on my left side, no problem breathing. When I sleep on my right side, my nose gets blocked and I mm. wake up breathing through my mouth. Interesting. I've had a deviated septum. I've had okay. most of my life. Okay. I've never had it fixed. I don't want to have it fixed because I've read about it. Yeah. <laughs> Horror stories. Yeah. yeah. What can I do to make sure I don't breathe? My, my nose doesn't get blocked when I sleep on my right side. Okay. Um, okay. So the nose is very temperamental and it's tight passages in there, very small, or nasal turbinates or your nasal concha. Um, we mentioned how there's that sort of blood flow change back and forth. Some of the time you feel that stuffiness may be blood flow, may not be mucus. Sometimes it may be mucus. Now, here's the one thing we know about the nose. The only thing that keeps the nose open is airflow. So the more you nose breathe, the more you will nose breathe. And the more you mouth breathe, the more you will mouth breathe. So it's really all about trying to get this thing to be open. There are techniques you can do to unstuff your nose, but mainly tempering it in a way that it forces the, the mouth closed. 
is ideally what we want. There's lots of different ways to do that. Some people use chin straps, some people tape their mouth. Plenty of people with deviated septums work through these issues. I, I, you're my brother, I have a deviated septum as well. Mine didn't get punched or anything like that. If, if, you look, if you're looking from up here, my whole skull turns like this. That's just sort of like the way my body is built, which means I've got a bend in the septum, so the right side is way more open, the left side is much more closed. So it stuffs up a little bit more easily. So what I advise you to do is A, play around with sleeping on either side, seeing how it goes, but really starting to experiment with a little bit of like, let's see what happens if I tape my mouth closed. I know that sounds nuts, but there's lots of different products out there that allow you to safely tape your mouth shut. Duct tape, right? Duct tape's a little aggressive. <laughs> I'm not telling you to duct tape it, right? My favorite thing is kinesio tape, which we use in a PT setting a lot because it only stretches in one direction. But what I advise people do is clean your lips, you know, and that's hard for you and me because we got all this facial hair. I gotta like get underneath this stuff. But once I've got that, take a little strip of tape, put it on an hour before bed. Walk around with it, do your reading, do whatever you're gonna do, and then go to bed and see how it goes. You might tear it off 20 minutes in. The next night you might leave it on for an hour, but two, three, four nights in, you'll realize that it's on the whole night. And you'll be like, wow, I didn't wake up, and I don't have that dry mouth in the morning, and I wasn't snoring, and I'm not super thirsty, and I didn't have like weird dreams, and I didn't pee myself. Like these are all the things that happen when our nervous system's going, all night, or worse yet. Like, it's basically drowning. So feeding your system what it wants. I would also experiment with basically not thinking of it as like right side or left side where I'm sleeping. I'd want to experiment with quarter turning, propping yourself with pillows so that you're like laying not completely on your side, but laying sort of like half-sided. One of the things we love to do in the hospital is like puff you up with pillows. So taking that approach, be like, okay, stuff a little pillow under my butt, stuff another pillow under my leg, and sort of quarter turn me. That makes a big, big difference. Especially when you put another one little pillow under the, or another like little wedge underneath your pillow so your head's not like this, it's instead like that. Kind of quarter turn the other way. So it starts draining back. It's a great question. Yes? So, so um, I'm just curious about the exhale in sports. Uh, I've been, I'm a tennis player, and I've always considered the tennis grunt as being irritating. Sure. <laughs> and over dramatic. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. <laughs> and, uh, but it sounds like you had, you know, but it seems like it has some similarity to like a ki yeah. in martial arts. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And so what I think you're saying is it actually can be enhancing performance. So think of it this way. When I exhale against a little resistance, whether it's the ki or the or all of it stiffens my trunk. You know, like if you were going to come up and punch me in the stomach, what would I do? I'd go like that because I could take it. But if I didn't, I'd go boom. So it stiffens the trunk, which means my arm and my leg has more ability to produce force. Like, let's say right now we saw a patient who's supposed to come in here and, oh my God, they're stuck under their car. What are we going to do? Let's all get together. Ready? Rather than doing that, because if I hold my breath like that, which is completely closing my glottis, that's going to increase pressure in here. I can get a hernia. I can get an aneurysm. I can poop my pants. So rather than doing that, blowing out. That's where your force is. So putting that in in a serve is like real easy, right? You can get that. But maybe it's just with a little hit where you're just going like. That teeny little bit takes it from holding my breath or worst case not doing anything at all to just giving you a little something. And if it's 3%, 2%, 5% more powerful, man. But you can do it silently, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> just like that. Absolutely. But there, I, would say, I would say that there is a mental emotional element to making that sound. Because when I can make a loud sound in front of a lot of people, yeah. I'm really confident in myself. Well, One, I'm trying to be more irritating when I play. I'm you. I love it. I love it. Um, just to back that up, one of the patients that I've worked with who, who was the most impactful on me was a gentleman who had panic attacks from his time in Vietnam. 55 years of waking up like this. <gasps> Twice a night. Terrible. Like, what an awful way to live. He's like, I'm scared of everything. My back's against the wall of every room I go in. And the hardest test for him to perform in his evaluation 
was the sustained vocalization more than 64 decibels. Basically, time it, ah, uh, with a decibel meter. He was like, nope, can't hear it, don't want it. Like, the sound of his own voice and being loud made him feel so unsafe. So our voice is really tied in here. So if that tennis player can, they're probably feeling a little bit more like, bring it on, you know? Yeah. And they're like, God, what a weirdo. But hey, that's perfect because that's getting them off their game. You know, I think you're totally right. It is annoying. <laughs> Question. So uh, I'm coming at this presentation from a Parkinson's perspective. Yeah. With a Parkinson's perspective. And I'm wondering about the, the recommendations we often hear to get your heart rate to 80 to 85 or sometimes a little lower than that. But that's pretty, that's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. So how do I... How does that work if I'm focusing on keeping everything, uh, following your instructions? Like, yeah. what, what, what's your advice? Once so, I'm getting up to that peak level. Yeah. So here's the funny thing. When we're talking about heart rate, we're talking about a thing we can't control. Because so I'm like, okay, slow your heart rate down right now. Good luck, right? Speed it up right now. Also real hard. But what can you control? You can control your breathing. Now, this plays a role in Parkinson's, also in autonomic dysfunction, long COVID, all of these people have like restrictions on their heart rate, which what happens when you look at your heart rate? Your heart rate goes up because you're nervous about it. It's like taking your blood pressure makes your blood pressure go up. So in a way, changing the conversation from X, Y, and Z is your heart rate to X, Y, and Z is what I want you to do with your breathing. Because basically, if you can maintain functional breathing, you're safe. I've seen this with patients who have Parkinson's, who are in their 80s, where you know, 84 years old, so his max heart rate is basically about 135. But if he can breathe functionally while he's doing stuff, and he's maxing out his heart rate, I'll just be like, how do you feel? He's like, I feel great. I'm safe with that. I'm okay with his heart rate going up. Because cardiopulmonary-wise, he's supporting himself. His blood pressure is not too high. Right? He's sustaining an adequate level of pressure and he's pushing his system. And most of the heart rate and exercise recommendations are based off of like, like what's zone two cardio? Can you maintain a conversation while performing the exercise? I don't want you to have a conversation while you're exercising. I want you to focus on your breathing. So it's just, it's starting to unwind some of that and saying like, all right, let's just simplify this completely. Rather than giving you a number, I want you to just focus on your heart rate and that should take care of the number that you want. Does that make sense? So, but I'm looking a little bit back to what I think maybe David said about neuroplasticity and whether mm -hmm. there's any imaging about this. Because, um, for example, I don't like the study I'm about to reference, like, okay. at least as far as I can understand it. But sure. there's a study that recently showed that exercising at, this was from Yale, if you just look at Yale intense heart rate. Sure. Anyway, they'll, they found that it, the, DAT, the DAT scans, or, or at least an imaging scan of the brain, found that there was greater dopamine transport activity in people who exercise at this higher level. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if, if your position would be something like it's better to focus on breathing because of the systemic effects and then later worry about getting to that heart rate level mm -hmm. that seems to be what, they're, what, what the indications from research are telling us. And I think really what I guess I'm, I'm also saying is that I would be really interested in the, in the sort of research you're describing yeah. because that would be very interesting to see if that also correlate, if that effect could also be seen as a result of functional breathing. Well, yeah. I don't know how you measure that, and I'm sure you do. But. Well, yeah, you bring, up, you bring up an absolutely good point. I think, I think what I'd want to see, I would also want to see that study too, um, so I guess I have to do it. Uh, yeah. um, I think in general, if somebody were pushing their exercise and they're trying to get to the point that like, the heart rate's elevated, what if somebody could do more exercise with the same heart rate? Like that's, that's, that's the advocating is like, I want you to be able to push your system more within the exercise you're doing, which doesn't raise your heart rate, so that you can do more to cause the heart rate change that you want. It's like getting more bang for your buck. Make sense? Shannon's got her hand up because I, I think she's gonna contribute. Heart rate max target 
does it take them does it tend to take them less oh yeah they get there faster absolutely hundred percent so it's almost like an artificially higher correct heart rate, which might not take yes it's, it's like we're looking at the number like it's the same oh no that's terrible for these research studies that's yes about this subject because that would mean that you could be you could have the wrong people in your study proving a point that is right. not actually proving that exercise is beneficial. You're right. just proving that somebody who can't breathe very well. Right. But so you're actually proving that suffocation is beneficial. Correct. <laughs> yeah, because it's that's, like... That's what my question is yeah. about carbon dioxide. Okay, so if you're let's talk about it. So if you think about an objective measurement uh -huh. of possible, proper, better breathing uh -huh. versus not, I would think that carbon dioxide blood levels would be maybe one of them. CO yeah. I don't know. CO2 levels, CO2 tolerance. Yeah. So, so when you see blood CO2 levels Thank you. elevated, and I don't know what the time frame is from uh, an intervention to the breathing mm -hmm. to where those levels would come back normal, mm -hmm. because the effect of carbon dioxide on the brain itself mm -hmm. is not positive. But well, in large, giant doses all the time, but in smaller systemic doses, it's really helpful. It, it, so you made a comment about yeah. that. So, so that was one Okay. And two was, have you seen folks with abnormal CO2 blood measurements mm -hmm. from just a basic blood draw, mm -hmm. um, see those levels go down if there is a breathing intervention? So it depends on the patient, okay? So first let's talk about CO2 and then we're gonna talk about high and low levels. So CO2 is obviously sort of the, the balancing equation to oxygen. We think of it like it has to be 50-50, but it's really about 100 to one. And we're talking Correct, yeah. So CO2 is abundant in your body. Oxygen is only present in small amounts because large amounts of oxygen can be toxic, right? It's sort of like that idea of antioxidants. That's why that is, right? Oxidative stress. So CO2 is in abundance. And our tolerance level to it is highly plastic. It's always changing, okay? The more I dump it off, the less tolerant I will be. Can you say that again? The more CO2 I dump off by exhaling, the less tolerant I will be. So, so, more. so exactly. The point at which I feel that CO2 tolerance kick in is plastic. So basically right now, if you and I were to have you hold your breath as long as you could, blow it out like we did before, and then you spend two minutes breathing, and then we do it again, you'll hold it longer. Two minutes breathing more, you'll do it longer. This is how free divers train. But it's also how we train people to calm down. Because if for 100 years, if you showed up to the emergency room having a panic attack, what do you think they'd give you? Not a drug, they'd give you a paper bag. And you'd go <laughs> And in three or four breaths, you'd inhale your own exhaled carbon dioxide, and your blood vessels would open up, and your heart rate would go down, and you'd calm down, and you'd get a little high on your own supply, and weird, your panic attack is over. And what do kids do when they're really mad? They're like, I'm so mad, hold my breath! then they eventually have to breathe in again, they're like calm. So CO2 is really powerful. Now, let's talk about which patient we're talking about here. I'm gonna use two examples. One is a person who hyperventilates hardcore when they go out and exercise. They feel it right away. <sighs> that person's CO2 tolerance is like eeny, weeny, weeny. So any increase in it, which would come from like activity or burning more energy, is gonna make them feel short of breath. It's also going to affect their stress response emotionally. It's the same system. As soon as they feel a little stressed, they're gonna be like this, right? Because it feels like drowning. I don't care what the thing's going on, right? Drowning's pretty stressful. Now let's take the COPD patient who's just hyper inflated. They've been trying to get a bigger breath and a bigger breath and a bigger breath forever. But now they're stuck here and they can't get it out. So what they do is they retain CO2 to a pathologic level. And they get a little slow, and they get a little dopey, and they get a little sleepy, and eventually they get hypercapnic, and they have an imbalance, and they die, right? So those two people have different needs for CO2. What does the CO2 retainer need to be able to do? They need to be able to increase how much they can move that air so they can blow off the CO2 and move it. And the person who's intolerant of it needs to be able to blow off less, slow it down, pace your activity according to your breathing, and then they'll sort of end up meeting in the middle. So it's, CO2 is one of the most like weird kind of complicated concepts to understand, and I'm still trying to understand it. But bottom line, we can deal with more 
when we can tolerate this thing. One of the most unique groups that I work with is people that are dealing with intense PTSD. So there's an organization that just brought a bunch of veterans to Oregon so they could go and have psilocybin therapy. And they picked me to prep them. So we did a lecture like this two weeks ahead of time, functional breathing, feel it, see it, use it. Then two weeks later, we did an in-person workshop and we taught them how to hold their breath as long as they could because that's learning how to settle their mind, and calm their body and like let go a little bit. And that ultimately is exploring your consciousness. It's using this tool that we have to control the thing that we feel like we can't control in our nervous system. So it's this broad thing that whether we're talking about like the athlete who wants to be able to run farther and not get as short a breath, they need CO2 tolerance. The person who wants to calm down, they need CO2 tolerance. The person who's feeling short of breath all the time, we want to figure out, okay, is this an oxygenation issue or is this a CO2 tolerance issue? Because like you said, the person who's feeling like, oh my God, I'm just short of breath with everything, they're going to be hypocapnic. They're going to have low CO2 levels. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I know it's a little, it's such a weird, it's like a paradoxical circular question that comes back around. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Unless a question, it's more of an observation. You just mentioned that working with veterans and PTSD and, and uh, I come from this and absorbing this amazing information as a long-term cancer patient that mm -hmm. survived beyond mm -hmm. uh, like 20 years and now Yeah. Table. yeah. None of that ever came up. They just said, are you nervous? And then they give you a drug. Yeah. But the, but the getting rid of that stress, because stress is so much of a, a cancer diagnosis yeah. and treatments and on and on, I can, it would just be a great thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that kind of makes my day. I appreciate you sharing the story. And you're exactly right. I think when I started this thing, I didn't really know all of the applications. I had a million different ones in my mind. The first one that I knew coming out of the ICU was like, I can get somebody ready for surgery. You're gonna get chest wall surgery, you're gonna get whatever. Here's how to get ready. Here's how to own your functional breathing. Not just to help you like get out of bed and like put on your clothes and like take that first poop or whatever you're gonna do or cough, but to just calm down on the table. You know, the, the, the person who I think of as, she had surgery on her, on her chest wall 27 years ago and it was so bad from a like, experience standpoint. No complications, just like she had a vagal event, she passed out, she got really scared, lots of drugs, like you said, there's that big push. But she knew she had to have another surgery. So we spent a couple of weeks just getting her ready. And she's like, Andy, when I went in there, I was so calm, it was relaxing, I was able to just like let go. And that's really what this is. It's letting go because, yeah, my breathing controls me and I control my breathing and I can live in that paradox. I can control what I can control and I can let go of whatever else is there. Yeah, that's well said. I appreciate it.